Becky has already asked you how many of you have been watching the Olympics and has talked a little bit about the Olympics. And I want to open with a story. This is a true story of one of the Olympians that you've been watching, Michael Phelps. After four Olympiads back in 2012, he was the most decorated uh, athlete in the Olympics ever. Uh, but after a damaging photo that showed him using drugs through a, a bong and two DUI arrests, his life hit bottom. And on September 30, 2014, Phelps left the Horseshoe Casino in Baltimore and uh, ha having drank too much, foolishly got behind the wheel of a, of a car and, uh, he, uh, and he was driving and uh, he, the police pulled him over going 81 miles an hour in a 55 zone and uh, there's a video of him going through the Fort, Mc, uh, Fort McHenry, my, my mind went blank there, I've been through that tunnel many times, the Fort McHenry tunnel which you're supposed to stay, you pick a lane before you get in and you stay in it until you come out and he was passing vehicles going 80, over 80 miles an hour swinging back and forth inside that that tunnel, very, very foolish uh, of what he would do had done. A breathalyzer test revealed a blood alcohol level that was nearly twice the legal limit. He was charged with a DUI, his second in, two, in 10 years, and for the next week, Phelps languished in his Baltimore home, curled up in his bedroom with thoughts of suicide careening through his mind. But prompted by God, he received an unexpected phone call from longtime friend, NFL star Ray Lewis, who had also given his life to Christ earlier. And immediately, Lewis sensed the hopelessness and despair in Phelps on the phone, and Lewis convinced Phelps to seek help at the Meadows, a behavioral rehab facility outside of Phoenix, Arizona. And Phelps entered rehab carrying a book that Lewis had given to him, the Purpose Driven Life book by Rick Warren. We, uh, several years ago, did that as a church-wide campaign here. Many of you have read that book. And Phelps says, it turned me into believing that there is a greater power than myself and there is a purpose for me on this planet. Now, the first chapter of Purpose Driven Life is titled, It All Starts with God. And the first four words of the book is, It's Not About You. Against all the popular philosophies of this world, competing in the Olympics, winning more medals than any other Olympian in history, and global fame did not bring happiness to Michael Phelps. Instead, he became a drunken, drug-using, and depressed man on the edge of suicide. And so, if you're here this morning and you want to be happy, just fulfilling all the things that the world tells you you need, being rich and being famous and being able to be successful, does not bring happiness. And so this morning, as we continue in our sermon series, Greatest Sermon, on the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached, and we have it in Matthew chapter five verses or chapter five through seven. The message this morning is: it's not your show. And uh, you'll remember earlier, if, if you were here in the earlier message, Jesus said that your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And in chapter 5, over and over again, he said, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people, I was thinking about this this week as I've been working on this sermon. There are a lot of people today, the popular thing to say is, oh, well, I'm not interested in the church. I don't like church, but I love Jesus. I want to tell you, if you really read the Bible, I mean, if you really read the Bible, if you really read what Jesus said, He's a lot tougher on you than the church will ever be. He, there, there's, there's no easy uh, going with Jesus, and he has high standards. And so these laws of the Pharisees and how they expected people to, to live them, Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, 
you've heard it said, but I say unto you. And he always elevated it to a higher level. And so today he's, he's showing us the effect of, of being self-centered in comparison to truly living out our lives for God. And the first thing that we want to notice is to keep the focus off yourself. Keep the focus off of yourself. It's not your show. That's the title of the message. It's not about you, are the words of Rick Warren. It's not about us. Jesus says that when we give or pray or fast or any other act of righteousness, we are not to do it for personal recognition. In, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. You know, every time you do something good for somebody, you don't have to take a picture and post it on Facebook. Uh, every time that you do something that's good, you don't have to get patted on the back and somebody tell you how wonderful you are. Every time you make a donation, even if it's a significant one, you don't have to have a building named after you. You know, you, you, it, it's not about you. It's not your show. And so if God leads you to give, then you should give, but not about uh, making uh, the recognition for yourself. But now this seems to contradict what Jesus had said earlier in chapter 5, and, and we had looked at this uh, uh, in a previous sermon. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And now in chapter 6, he says, don't do your good deeds in front of others. But if you will read those verses, you, uh, you will see that it is the motive that he is talking about. In, in Matthew uh, 5, 16, the motive is that, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. In Matthew 6, 1, the motive is that do not do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. It's the motivation of your heart. Yes, we are to live good lives and we're to do acts of righteousness. We're, we're to give, we're to help, we're to care. But what's the motive? Are, are you doing what you do in order to be recognized by human beings so that people will see you? Or are you doing what you ought to be doing so that others can see God and give him glory for what he has done? To, to be able to, to, for people who have known you all your life, to say, I know that person, and they're just not that good. It has to be God who is working in them and through them. And he talks about three specific areas that we are to keep the focus off of ourselves. The first that we've already looked at a little bit is good deeds. In Matthew 6, 2 and 3, it says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. We are to simply reach out and help others because it's the right thing to do. Because we realize that in Jesus Christ, we're all equal. We, we all have a responsibility to our fellow man, and it should not be so that we can get a pat on the back or some kind of a recognition. And, and see, going back with, with uh, Michael Phelps, you know, for all of his life, since he was a, a child, he had been training for the Olympics. And now after four, the four Olympics that he had been in after 2012, he was the most decorated uh, Olympian. And, and the crowds would cheer for him when he swam and and, you know, he was just used to being in the center of everything. And now his career was over at that point. He, of course, swam again, and, and we'll talk about that at the end of the message. But he thought it was all over. He, he couldn't deal with not being in the spotlight. And uh, in our lives, we need to be careful. Uh, I, I so, certainly don't want to simplify depression and say, well, it's a self-centered. I don't mean it that way. But sometimes we become discouraged and, and despair and depressed because we're, we're focusing on us 
And we need to focus on God and, and glorify him. And then also in prayer. In Matthew chapter five, or chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, that they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray for your, to your Father who is in heaven. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And this, for, for someone like myself who, who is always in the public eye in, in, in the leading of worship and leading of prayer, we have to be careful that, that in, in praying that we're not more concerned about the people hearing the prayer than what we are about God hearing the prayer. You know, we, we, we should not be praying to try to impress people. Now, Jesus is not putting on a prohibition against public prayer. He's still talking about motives. That you are not to pray in public just so you can be seen uh, by others, but pray to the Father. And, and we, uh, all through church history and all back through the Jewish religion, prayer has always been part of public worship. Jesus isn't saying that you shouldn't do that at all, but he's talking about our hearts. And sometimes people say, well, I can't pray in public. And, and the reason you say you can't pray in public is because you're concerned about what people think. Pray, give voice to your prayers. If you're asked to pray or if you're given an opportunity to pray, small groups is a wonderful place to be able to do that, to, to just be able to pray to God. Forget about the other people in the room. You're not praying to them. Pray to God. And uh, I often tell people, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, they'll laugh at me if I, don't, if I say something wrong. And I, I always say, uh, have you ever laughed at anybody when they prayed? Well, no. Well, then why do you think people would laugh at you? It's communication with God. And uh, so we, we need to be careful with uh, the motive of our heart. And same way with fasting in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that, that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, fasting was a normal part of the Jewish religion, and, and especially among the religious class, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, they, that was a natural part. But they didn't just fast, and go on with life, they wanted to make sure everybody was fast, or everybody knew that they were fasting. And so they would just have this sad face on, and they would just, everything would be obvious, well, this must be their fasting day because of the way they uh, were acting. By the way, if you don't know what fasting is, that means giving up food or something else to, do, to give that time to prayer. It's, it's an act of humility before God. It's an act of sacrifice uh, be able to communicate uh, with God. And uh, again, the motive, not to be seen of others, but to come before God and seek his will. The second thing that we want to look at this morning then is to pray in simple faith. Pray in simple faith. Keep yourself out of the focus. Keep the focus off of you and pray in simple faith. Our, our prayer should just be simple, just just like we're coming to our Father. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, it says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And, and I just want to real quickly go through this very simple prayer. They, they ask in another uh, gospel, they ask Jesus, how should we pray? It's placed here in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and Jesus is telling them how they should pray. And the first thing that we notice is that we are to pray to our good, good Father. Jesus said, pray our Father in heaven. That is absolutely amazing. 
To, to think that, that God, the holy God of heaven, hallowed be thy name, holy is your name. That this God who created all things, that sustains all things by his power, cares about us like a father for his children. In Psalm 139, uh, the psalmist David is just talking to God about how amazing it is that God watches over him. And, and, he, and he says, I, I knew you before you were born. Every day of your life is known to me. I think about you more than you know. Don't worry, you are safe in my hands. The, the, thought that, the thoughts that God has for us are so amazing. He knew us before we were born. He watched over our development in the womb. He cares about everything in life. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray to the Father. He's your Father. He's holy, hallowed be thy name, but he cares about us. The reality is this morning that your life matters. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter where you were born or where you live or how much money you have or how little money you have or what your education status is. You are loved by God and your life matters. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. That's for each and every one of us. And, and so when Satan comes and he tries to destroy, and in and, 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 and John 10.10 10 it goes on and talks about Satan comes to try to, to kill and to steal and to destroy. And when he comes and he tries to steal your faith and when he tries to steal your joy and when he tries to remind you of things from the past and maybe destroy your, your reputation, when those things happen, go to God. Our Father who art in heaven, and he cares about each of us. I read this week someone said, why wish upon a star when you can pray to the one who created the star? Why wish upon a star when you can pray to the one who created the star? Focus on God's kingdom and God's will, okay? If it's not about us, If it's not about you and if it's not about me, who's it about? Well, it's about God. Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done. We spend a whole lot of time trying to build our kingdom, trying to build our wealth, trying to build whatever we have for ourselves. But uh, Jesus is saying here we should pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom and my kingdom is going to end. It's limited. It's, It's only going to last for a little while, and it'll be gone. But God's kingdom is forever. And in in this prayer, Jesus is saying that we are to pray for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. He he wants us to desire for his will to be accomplished here. Some people think, oh, well, we, we can never experience the kingdom of God in this world. Then you don't believe Jesus when he taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said that we are to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to have confidence in our Father, whose name is holy, that his kingdom, it will come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we are to depend upon God for each day. As Americans, we have been blessed as a nation with prosperity. Many of us has, have been brought up uh, with, with a work ethic to, to work hard with your hands and, and to uh, earn your own uh, keep and, and to lay aside for the future. And, and many, as we grow older, we look and say, well, I have this amount in, in a bank account, and I have this in investments, and this is in the pension, and we'll be getting Social Security. And, and we, and we put our confidence in all those things. That's not where our confidence is to come. Our confidence comes from God. Jesus said, pray, give us today our daily bread. And one of the things that, that as, as far as the pros- prosperity of America, that we have not experienced, that generations past have experienced, 
and what people in other parts of the world experience is to wake up in the morning and don't know where your meals are coming from. What am I going to eat today? You know, with, with me, if I'm eating breakfast, I, I ask my wife, well, what's for dinner? You know, and while I'm eating breakfast, she's packing lunch. And, uh, and if she forgets, I know where the refrigerator is and where the food is stored. But there are many people that wake up in the morning and they have their children and they have their family and they don't even know where the food is coming from. Jesus said we are to depend on God every day. If, if you're familiar with the story of the children of Israel in the wilderness, uh, they crossed over the Red Sea and into the wilderness and, and Moses was leading this great group of people, some estimate somewhere between one and three million people that were in that crowd, and they didn't have time to, to pack food. And secondly, in those days, they didn't have the kind of uh, refrigeration and, and being able to keep things uh, over a period of time, and if they would have packed, they wouldn't, it wouldn't have lasted very long in the wilderness. And so they were out in the wilderness, and all these people were waiting for God to provide for them. And God provided manna for them. But he said, I'm going to provide for you enough for today. And if you take too much, it's going to spoil. And some of them said, well, God will never know. And they would they take it and they hide it. And it would have worms the next morning. It was only for what the, the day that they were, were to gather. And then on the Sabbath, they were to gather for two days because they were not to work on the Sabbath. And their manna would last for the two days. But if they try to keep it any longer than that, it would be ruined. And so that's the example of give us this day our daily bread to depend on God. Because even though we might have all kinds of investments and we might have all kinds of, of uh, things that we think keep us secure, it doesn't take long for things to change. You might be healthy today and in the hospital before today's over. Uh, you may have all kinds of things invested. We saw this in 2008, and we've seen it other times in, in American history, where you go to bed at night and think you have X number of dollars, and you wake up the next morning, and a large chunk of that's gone. And I've, if you've been around for a while, I told the congregation uh, here before, you know, all through my ministry the church puts aside a certain amount for my pension. And uh, I had been in the ministry by 2008. I had been in the ministry for uh, 34 years. And, and in 2008, all of the interest money on all that had been invested by the church for my pension was gone. All that was left was the principal that the church had given. And many of you had the same kind of experience. And so Jesus said, when you pray, pray for your daily bread, put confidence in him for every day. And then he says, forgive as you, we have forgiven others. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if I give, forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What a, what a serious thing to realize as Christians if we don't forgive others what they've done against us, then Jesus does not forgive us. Our Father does not forgive us in heaven. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And we might say, well, you don't know what that person did. It's impossible for me to forgive. We all have those stories. We all have those experiences. I said a few weeks ago, if you're over four years old, you've had some things that uh, aren't good in your life, uh, maybe even many uh, younger than that. But we need to forgive. If we want to be forgiven, we need to forgive. And Jesus is both our model and our master in this. Not only is he telling us that we are to forgive others, but he is forgiven. Just, just think about this. Jesus is holy. He never committed one act of sin. And he came into this world and the human race rejected him. And they spat upon him. And they mocked him. And they beat him. And they nailed him to a cross. And he endured all of that 
for the sins of the world, the sins of the very people who put him there. And through that blood that was shed on Calvary, he forgives us. Now, if that is the example, if that is the model of forgiveness, is there any of us who can say, well, I can't forgive somebody else because of what they've done for me. If Jesus forgave us our sins after what he has gone through, what our sins put him through, how can we say to someone else, well, that, what you did to me is too much. I can't forgive it. We need to have a forgiving spirit. And then the prayer for protection from temptation and from the tempter, from the evil one. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I was having a conversation with someone this morning about baseball. I'm sure you're surprised that that would come up. And uh, th this person initiated the service by talking about some guy in a pinstripe uniform that retired this week. I won't mention any names or nicknames or anything like that. But, uh, and, then, and then we got over somehow to Pete Rose. And of course, Pete Rose has been excluded from the Hall of Fame because of gambling. And I had known this, but the person I was speaking to said, do you know where he lives? I said, no. He said, he lives in Las Vegas. Well, now let me see. If you want to get into the Hall of Fame and gambling is keeping you out, why would you want to, keep, why, why would you want to live close to all the casinos? Not all of them. There's, they're all over the place now. But why would you want to live at the place that's known for its casinos? You know, Stay away from the temptation. And sometimes, the reason I'm bringing that up is not to bash Pete Rose, even though he was a Philly. Uh, I, that is not the reason that I brought that up. But, you know, sometimes we're just like that. You know, we say, oh, God, protect us from temptation, and then we go right into the very thing that we want protected from. You see, we, he provides a means of escape, but we have to cooperate with him. We don't go live there. We don't go participate there. We don't go and, and, and live among the same people that got us involved in those kinds of things. We have to put some effort in to finding that way of escape that he has given. Well, I want to conclude with some of the more up-to-date things now about Michael Phelps to try to illustrate what we've been talking about. You know, when you when you make yourself the center of everything, it's not going to bring happiness and it's not going to bring good things. But Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, also convinced Phelps to reconcile with his father because God's heart is always for reconciliation. Fred Phelps was surprised when he got an invitation to attend a family week with his son. The younger Phelps was even more surprised when his father accepted the invitation. I was shocked, Michael told ESPN. I didn't think he would come. And when the two men first saw each other, they opened their arms and embraced in a big hug. It was good, challenging at times, but probably the biggest learning experience we've had with one another, Michael says. And in November 2014, Phelps left the Meadows Rehab Facility and resumed training for the Rio Olympics. Three months later, he asked his longtime girlfriend, Nicole Johnson, to be his wife. And on May 5, 2016, Boomer Robert, their firstborn, came into the world. From curled up on a sofa thinking about suicide to turning his life over to, to God and getting his focus off himself and being able to live a productive life and, and having restoration with his father. Now, I'm not trying to set Michael up as some kind of a model, or model Christian. He's a baby Christian, and I don't know what's going to happen. He's retiring again. I'm not saying that he's a model. I'm, just, I'm trying to illustrate that when you get your focus off yourself and get God at the right place in your life, the difference that it can make. But, take, but since he has taken that focus off himself and putting his focus on God, Phelps is now back in his fifth 
Olympic Games, adding to his medal count, and he added again last evening, ending now, I believe, probably ending his career with another gold medal. And the difference that it makes when we take our minds off of ourselves and put God where he belongs in our lives, that he would have first place. And next week we're going to talk about that even more. But before we put God where he belongs, we have to begin by taking ourselves out of focus. We have to get ourselves out of, you know, everything has to be for me. I have to like everything. I, it has to go the way I want it to go. It's all got to be my, for my benefit. No, we need to move, remove ourselves from the focus and pray that God's kingdom come and his will be done. That's what should be focused and center in our lives. It's not your show. It's not about you. It all begins with God. And if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, you never made a decision to follow Jesus, that's the first place to begin. You may not be happy. You may, may have all kinds of problems and dysfunctions in your life. The place to begin is turning away from yourself and what you want. Turn to God. Ask Jesus to forgive your sin and be your Savior and make a choice to follow him. I'm going to close with a prayer, and in that closing prayer, I'm going to pray a prayer of confession and repentance. If you'll pray that prayer with me and mean it in your heart, Jesus will forgive your sin, and you can begin a new life of following after Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your great love to us. We thank you, Lord, that your word applies to this very day. How a man who was drunken, using drugs, depressed, suicidal, got his focus off his self and got his focus on you and his life was turned around. Lord, you want to do that for many people. And for those of us who have already experienced that, Lord, help us to realize that your desire is that we, you, that we would take that message to others. There are people all around us. They may give us all kinds of problems in our workplace or in our homes or in our schools or in our neighborhood or in the community, wherever it may be, because they're so self-focused. But Lord, we have the gospel we can take to others. Help us to take it to the world. And then, Lord, we pray if there's any among us who do not know you as Savior, have never chosen to follow Jesus, that they would pray this prayer in their heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin, and I've committed acts of sin. And today I confess to you my sins, and I confess to you that I need a Savior. And I know that only you, Jesus Christ, and forgive me. And so I repent. I change my mind. I turn around. I turn from my sins and my life of sin. And I turn to you. And I ask you, dear Jesus, to forgive my sin and to be my Savior. And today I choose to follow you. For the rest of my life, my desire is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would answer that prayer in the hearts of people this morning. May you be glorified and may many come to know Christ through the ministry of this church and these people. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.